All right, we're going to kind of cover a lot today. It's going to be a lot of the politics and conformity of and early civil rights, kind of leading from the 1950s to 1968. Um, anyway, we're going to start by kind of going over the boomers. The boomers, we today we say like, okay, boomer. All right, this is the baby boomers. All right, so they are the babies that are born after World War II. So a lot of them are born in like 1960, 1950, meaning today they would be like, you know, 80 to 60. These are a lot of the grandparents, um, you know, retired folks. Um, these would be the boomers today. So again, they're born after World War II and um, between World War II and 1960. These are what we call the boomers. And women before, like in World War II, you're going to have like Rosie the Riveter go out and work. And now in the 1950s, after World War II, people are encouraged to go back and be a housewife again. There's a lot of cultural push for this, you know, media and all of that. So um, there is a bigger middle class. Um, there is a continuation of, you know, loans and things like that car ownership is going to come up and the whole car culture and so for essentially for like white folks during this time um, especially you have a rising middle class you have the GI Bill you have all of these things happening people are getting babies all that stuff um, but what's happening in the south is we still have Plessy versus Ferguson and segregation and in the North, we do not have Jim Crow laws, but nevertheless, we have segregation. What's happening in the North is more, you know, it's called de facto segregation. It's not that the state is like segregating, but there are policies and practices that are segregating the cities. One of these is Levittown. These are mass produced houses. So just like a Ford car looks the same, these houses all look the same because they are mass produced. One group would like, you know, lay down the the floor. One group would like, so this group would like come down before them and lay down the floor. Then these guys are going to put up, I don't know, the walls. And you end up with houses, you know, there's a song where they all look like ticky tacky and they all look just the same. There's stories of people who would like, here's their little cars that all look the same. Some people would even drive up and go to the wrong house because, you know, it looked exactly the same as the one next to them. And the reason why, again, is just because it was mass produced. Um, people, well, white folks are able to get home loans for this. Um, but the thing is, they had restricted covenants in the North that said no person of any, uh, any race other than the white Caucasian race shall own, use, or occupy any buildings in Levittown. So Levitt is the guy who's coming up with these mass produced suburbs, especially outside of New York. And um, black, he excludes black folks from owning any of these little ticky tacky houses. Restricted covenants. We talked about redlining that was happening before. And so um, you could watch this again if you wanted to go through on the um, thing. But, um, you know, folks in the suburbs are being excluded by de facto segregation in the north as much as they are in the south by, um, you know, de jour segregation or Jim Crow laws. Media is also kind of focusing on these baby boomer, right, babies. They are like having television shows like Howdy Doody and kids are spending a really long time watching television um, with these family programs. But when you look at these families that are on these family programs, it is this middle class ideal. They are white. They are the nuclear family. They have traditional gender roles. A lot of the titles are like father knows best or, you know, all, you know, uh, all these other things. And so the, the man works outside. He has a gray flannel suit. The wife is at home. They have the white, you know, appliances and the white picket fences and their perfect little homes. And they're really promoting this idea of this white middle class. Leave it to Beaver is another one that you could look at. Um, you know, advertising, we can't really take a look at any of these things, but you know, we have like fluff and jello and really this idea of consumer culture during this time. TV dinners and white picket fences and all of that stuff on television. Uh, franchises are gonna be a thing. We're gonna have the first McDonald's. Again, with this idea of mass produced things, we are creating highways, we are creating cars, and we are creating everything that goes around with the car culture. 
Um, we have drive-ins and all of that. Rock and roll is going to be um, <clears throat> invented in the 1950s as a part of this youth culture. We'll take a look at these two musical forms when we identify um, like counterculture versus culture. And yeah. So nonconformity is also around. We have, you know, Jack Kerouac who is, you know, talking about criticizing this consumer culture or this beatnik culture. These guys are just, you know, wandering the earth. Um, they're kind of like proto hippies when we talk about them later. Anyway, you have a growing middle class that is happening in uh, the United States, and a lot of it is supported by the government. You have government loans, you have the GI Bill, you have um, all these things. And these folks, these men who are working, are, are working in a lot of corporations um, and all of this. So there's a lot of conformity in media, there's a lot of conformity in these like gender roles, and there's a lot of conformity in po politics. Um, there's a liberal consensus. There's a strong middle in the United States in the 1950s and 60s. People generally agree that there should be an anti-communist foreign policy, right? People believe in containment. People believe that there should be an anti-communist domestic policy. People believe that, that the New Deal is a good thing. That the People believe that the government should help out people to, to raise the middle class. People believe in the nuclear family and like gender relations. Um, and so during the 1950s and 60s, there is a strong, what they call liberal consensus, where people generally agree on this. Um, so both political parties, Democrat and Republican, believe that we should, you know, help out the world with capitalism, all of these sorts of things. So um, Truman is a Democrat. He does the fair deal. He does the Housing Act with FHA loans. He also does the GI Bill of Rights, which gives veterans pay for college. We're going to have a much um, more educated, college-educated class of folks after World War II. Um, and we have an expansion of Social Security. So Truman believes in expanding the New Deal. Um, <clears throat> what is going to really divide the Republicans and the Democrats is kind of who is harder on communism. So... In 1949, after China falls to communism and the Soviets test an atom bomb, uh, Senator McCarthy is going to, um, you know, really go after Democrats, go after the Secretary of State, go after people, and talk about enemies from within. After the Soviets, you know, explode their atomic bomb or test their bomb, people start to freak out. One of those people is McCarthy, but everybody else does too. We took a look at this duck, duck and cover video not that long ago, right? Kids are, um, you know, hiding under their desks. You have people who are building, um, you know, bomb shelters. So there's this kind of psychic thing of like, you know, living in under the bomb in the 1950s and 60s. These same school kids who are ducking and covering, these are still the baby boom generation. They're born after World War II. They're raised under the bomb. They're ducking and covering under their desk, right? They are constantly afraid of dying in nuclear annihilation. Um, people are also going after spies because we believe that the communists could never be as good as America. We start to believe that the only reason why um, they have the bomb is because of enemies within. We do find spies under the Rosenbergs um, who worked for the Communist Party in the 30s and 40s, but Julius and um, Ethel, his wife, are going to be charged and found guilty and sentenced to death for espionage, for leaking um, the Manhattan Project. A lot of people wonder if Ethel was actually guilty um, her children are going to be orphaned, and actually, sadly, when she was executed, it was, like, botched, and it was terrible, and anyway, it's kind of one of these things where people kind of feel like, um, Ethel was, uh, wrongfully killed for this espionage. Um, McCarthyism is really the, like, you know, this idea that we're going to search from within to, like, root out communism. So McCarthy starts to say that he has a certain number of people that he knows are going to be, you know, our communists. And first he starts with, um, you know, the secretary, the, the um, Department of State. 
But really what, you know, the big line here is it's the enemies from within. McCarthyism is obsessed with rooting out spies, with rooting out known communists. And so they start in the Department of State. They move on to like the movie industry. And it's like kind of all, they start to root out any known communist out of the movie industry. Um, they start to try to root out any known um, communist in the army. Once they move on to the army, they get in. he gets in more trouble. But all of this is televised, and it is kind of making people afraid to be more radical or to be communist. Along with this, you know, as time of conformity and, you know, white picket fences and white people on television, um, there are legal challenges with um, segregation. You have to also put this in the context of containment and the Cold War because the, you know, Soviet Union was pointing out the obvious problems of inequality in the United States. Like, you say you're democratic, you say you're free, well, look at what you're doing to, you know, with segregation and Jim Crow. So one of the reasons why I think, you know, we start to, to address civil rights after World War II is because of the Cold War. Uh, because we want to prove that America is better than anyone else. So Brown v. Board really sets off the civil rights struggle. You had, um, <clears throat> you know, the, the Black Monroe Elementary and an all-white Sumner Elementary. And um, she would have to go to school. She would have to pass this, like, all-white Sumner Elementary, which had better um, materials, better school, better all around, to go to her school. And when Brown versus Board of Education goes to uh, court, what they say is that separate but equal doctrine of Plessy versus Ferguson is that um, separate but equal has no place and separate but equal is inherently unequal. And what I really want to focus on is this word inherently. You know, what does it mean to be inherently unequal? Separate but equal has no place. Separate but equal is inherently unequal. So. If we take a look at this, this is a, you know, the decision that overturns Plessy v. Ferguson. If it's inherently unequal, if I could copy and play, paste one school and I took the white school and if I could take the teachers, if I could take the, every single brick and I could like copy and paste it, right? And I would be like, here's the white school, here's the black school. If everything was equal, would it be equal? Well, according to this word inherently, there is no way to separate people and have it be equal, right? And so you can't spend your way out of this. And inherently goes down to this idea of like the doll experiment that folks are like internalizing this like segregation. Like folks know why they are segregated. So they are internalizing like these negative ideas about themselves, about, you know, skin color. And so when they would give someone, you know, a white doll, they would say like, oh, this is a nice doll, but black dolls, they're bad, right? The only difference is the skin color. And so inherently means that people are internalizing discrimination, people are internalizing segregation, and there's no way to um, equalize this. You have to integrate. So integration becomes the only option for schools in 1954. But of course, it is going to take a long time for schools to actually integrate, and it's going to take a lot of struggle. Meanwhile, what's happening in... Um, Montgomery is that Rosa Parks is going to be arrested for refusing to give up her, her bus seat to a white person. Now, she is not the first person to do this. She is essentially set up by the NAACP to do this because they thought she would make a good person to do it. Um, anyway, she this this is an example of civil disobedience. Civil disobedience is knowingly uh, violating the law right knowingly going against an unjust law and getting arrested right when you take a look at rosa parks she knew exactly what she was doing she knew she was going to get arrested she was not just tired right she is starting a movement she has already been organized under the naacp you know martin luther king jr is or the reverend dr martin luther king jr is ready to jump on and what they're ready to do is go into an economic protest which is a boycott so it starts with civil disobedience, which sets off an economic protest or boycott. And African Americans show their strength by not riding on the bus. They give each other rides. And essentially, they're about to, um, 
you know, what do you call that? Uh, put these, this bus company under because they're not riding it anymore. So they're showing the, the importance of economic protest and boycotts and it works, right? The buses are going to integrate and it's the beginning of Mark, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s, uh, you know, prominence in the movement. Eisenhower is going to be elected in 1952. Um, I don't think this thing lets me play YouTube videos, but it's a crazy ad. Anyway, um, he is right down the middle. He is a Republican, but he could have very well been a Democrat. His big thing that he's going to do is the National Interstate and Defense Act. He builds the highways. Um, now, where are we going to build these highways? Right through like prominently black neighborhoods, like the 10 goes right through the Treme. But this is what he's going to do, and he's going to connect the entire nation um, like none before. And so this Interstate Defense and Highway Act is is huge. This is what's going to promote car culture. We're going to have hotels and McDonald's and everything else. And the entire nation is going to be more unified, more um, homogenous, because, you know, I'm going to have the same thing in California that I'm going to have in, like, Louisiana. Um under Eisenhower, he's also going to integrate Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, he was not the biggest integrationist, but when Arkansas Governor Arvel Faubus decides to use the National Guard to stop integration, um, Eisenhower is not going to let that go. And he actually sends in the National or the U.S. Airborne Division. Now, these dudes had, like, you know, dropped in to you know germany it is the most highly skilled uh, force and eisenhower uses these, these um the airborne to escort kids to school against what could have been the national guard of arkansas so the this is you know what i want to kind of point out is this is not nonviolent, right this is using the point of a gun of the government to integrate folks into school. And I guess like one thing to think about as we get into the discussion later is like, is this good for kids to go to a school that they need to be escorted in at gunpoint? I don't know. No, I think they're very brave. But is this one of the goals as we're talking about integration, um, you know, later on, you know, is this good for kids to go to schools that they are not essentially welcomed in? Um, Kennedy is going to come in in 1960. He is elected. He is young. He is going to win against Nixon, essentially because he looked really good on television. Um, he was Catholic, and that was an issue at first. He's the first Catholic president. He's young and inexperienced. Um, and he gets Johnson as a vice president to appeal to Southern Democrats. Kennedy kind of wins the surprise election, or wins in a surprise in this election. Nixon had a lot more experience, but he is going to win. Um, under Kennedy's presidency, students become much more radicalized, um, starting with sit-ins in uh, Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, and this is also another example of civil disobedience. These folks are sitting at a, at a counter, knowingly violating the law, essentially waiting to be arrested. What's going to happen when these folks are arrested? More people are going to sit and violate the law. They're going to be spit on, they're going to be beat up, and they are going to use nonviolent direct action um, and civil disobedience to kind of challenge these laws. So they had to go to training. They had to be, like, you know, uh, supported. And the other thing is, is that white folks and black students are going to be involved in these sit-ins, um, starting in Greensboro and moving all to all different places throughout the South. SNCC is one of the main, um, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee is one of the main organizing, uh, uh, organizations for students. These are the folks who are doing sit-ins, leaders, um, other activities. It would basically have like a SNCC group, like at colleges that would organize, you know, different places. And so colleges become a major organizing factor for SNCC. One of the things they're going to do is freedom rides. Folks basically would spend their summer. They would get in a bus in say New York, and they would they would integrate the different places. White folks would sit in the black areas, and black folks would sit in the white areas, 
and they would essentially try to make it one of the the first one tried to make it to new orleans and they did not make it essentially their bus was firebombed they were dragged out of the bus and beat up and again this isn't even like they're not the only ones on the bus um at what as well um so this becomes a, an example of like essentially national attention is drawn to this this is on television the whole world is watching and it shows that the south was actually disregarding the law the freedom riders should have been able to make it because the national government passed a um, interstate commerce clause that said that they should integrate buses but the south didn't care so essentially folks like ministers white folks black folks all of these people they basically spent their summers getting arrested to make a point about um, integrating buses in the South. James Meredith is another major person who's going to be integrating the University of Mississippi. Um, but the one I'll probably focus on the most is MLK. Um, he is going to be in Birmingham. This is an example of direct nonviolent action. He is protesting. He goes to Birmingham and Bull Connor is like probably one of the most racist people in America. And he is like, you are not going to march. He arrests uh, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., uh, who is going to write his letter from a Birmingham jail there. Um, and then many of the adults are going to be arrested. And then days later, the only people left to march are children. And so on televisions, you have, you know, images of children being attacked by dogs, you know, children being like sprayed by hoses. And these are playing out on in front of people's faces like as they're eating dinner so the united states is being shown for what it is i mean bull connor could have done this you know years before he could imprison people he could like you know set dogs on people i think one of the differences in the 1960s is that the media is watching right the media is taking these pictures and bull connor is getting like broadcast throughout the united states about how terrible things are in the South. Um, so probably one of the most famous things from Birmingham is a letter from a Birmingham jail. MLK wrote to moderate white religious people. And essentially what he says is that we have to do nonviolent direct action. Um, you know, a lot of like moderate religious people were like, can't you just wait? Why are you being so uh, aggressive or agitated? And essentially, why don't you just wait? Um, and, you know, MLK writes the, I mean, this is probably one of my favorite uh, pieces of writing in American history, like really that I read. And what he says is that, you know, you cannot wait, right? Uh, we need to do nonviolent direct action. Um, and we need to basically go against laws that are unjust. We can't just like comply. Um, anyway, that's not that great. Kennedy is going to support MLK and he's actually going to propose a civil rights act on TV, um, which leads to the March on Washington. This is where MLK goes up and he talks about his dream of equal opportunity, right? Children one day will live in a nation. They will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. So he is going up to support the equal rights amendment not everyone agrees that this is a good thing right uh malcolm x is gonna from the nation of islam is gonna say this is nothing but a picnic right that you know this integrated march of equal opportunity and like kumbaya this is not what everybody wants that you need to have a more militant um you know approach and you know that integrating it is actually weakening it. It's pro I like this quote where it just says, when you got coffee that's too black, which means it's too strong, what do you do? You integrate it with cream. You make it weak. But if you pour too much cream in it, you won't even know you had coffee. It used to be hot, it becomes cool. It used to be strong, it becomes weak. It used to wake you up, and now it puts you to sleep. So essentially what he's saying is that, you know, any of the radicalness of the movement is kind of like losing it as you're trying to integrate into like the greater society. It needs to be more challenging. Women are also asking for equal rights in 1963. Um, and Betty Friedan is going to write the feminine mystique around the same time we have the March on Washington. Essentially, Betty Friedan uh, wrote about the, um, you know, the question that had no name. And 
what she talks about is this feeling that women had that there should be something more, right? And this is a very middle class, very white thing, but, you know, we can no longer invoice, long, longer ha ignore the voice that I want something more than my husband and my children and my home. The problem that has no name, I'm sorry. The problem that has no name, which is simply the fact that American women are kept from growing to their full capacity um, in taking a far greater toll on physical and mental health. Essentially, you know, women are sitting in these like little ticky tacky houses with their, you know, children with the, doing the dishes many of these women were like educated and they're th asking themselves the unheard question is there more and so Betty Friedan starts to want to ask for like you know equal rights and um you know more opportunity in work and other things um Kennedy is going to be assassinated also in 1963 um and LBJ is going to take uh, office. Lyndon Baines Johnson is from the South. Uh, we looked a lot at him. He's going to also like, you know, escalate the Vietnam War. Um, but today we're going to look at his social program, which is he, he really believed in helping out the poor. He wanted to have a war on poverty. He wanted to help out, right, basically end poverty as we know it. And he's going to make what is called the Great Society. He is going to win the 1964 election by a landslide. And he passes the war on, on poverty. He passes what's known as the Great Society. This is kind of like the height of the liberal consensus. He passes the Civil Rights Act, which gives equal opportunity and ends Jim Crow. He passes Medicaid. He passes Medicare. He passes Head Start. He does urban renewal. He, does, he helps with projects and housing and HUD and highways. He does the Immigration Act. He's the reason why we have immigrants who are coming in after 1965 from all areas of the world he does the housing act he does rent subsidies he does fair housing he makes redlining illegal this guy does a lot um so he makes a ton of advances in civil rights he passes the civil rights act the voting rights act and the fair housing act in 1968 it is the height of the liberal consensus right Food stamps, Head Start, Medicaid, Medicare, Immigration Act, public broadcasting, all of these things. Probably the one, if I was to remember one, would be the Civil Rights Act of 1964. This is what outlawed segregation in public places, outlawed unequal application of voter registration, and actually also provided equal employment opportunity for women. The National Organization for Women is going to organize to try to force him to actually do Title VII. Um, of the 1964 Civil Rights Act and push for women equality. And after they pass the um, Civil Rights Act, which gets rid of segregation in the South, people start to fight, fight for the Voting Rights Act. Um, in 1965, this is um, the, the, in Selma, Alabama, the Edmund Pettus Bridge, people are going to be marching to um, for voting rights as they pass the bridge um, they are going to be gassed, they are going to be beaten, and they are going to be attacked. The 24th Amendment and the Voting Rights Act is going to be passed in 1965. So they march in Selma, and then we get the 24th Amendment, which uh, prohibits poll taxes, and we get the Voting Rights Act in 1965. And I do want to say that there are successes, right, with the Voting Rights Act. We're going to have more African American representation. I think John Lewis is a good example of this. You know, he was the son of a sharecropper. He went through SNCC. Uh, he is in the big six. He works with Martin Luther King. He goes to the March on Washington. He marches on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, and then he's going to become a congressperson in 1986. So, you know, we are going to talk about the negatives, but this is probably one of the more positive examples of, like, progress. This is him marching with um, Obama in 2015. But the problem is, after 1964, after 1965, after we pass all of these things, there is still racial separation that occurs, and it is by a matter of fact. We've gotten rid of Jim Crow laws in 1964 with the Civil Rights Act, but the problem is there is still languishing inequality, there is still de facto segregation, there is still police brutality, there is still white flight. 
There is still a lack of equity. There is still like an unequal uh, curriculum that does not value other cultures. There are still healthcare disparities. There are still laws that have changed, but law lives have not. And so for African Americans, you know, they have been fighting for so long to get rid of segregation. Once that law has been passed, it's like, what do we work on now, right? Um, now people have to get political. Now people have to get in there and work on like urban decay and de facto school segregation and legal barriers. It is a tough road ahead. Some folks like uh, Stokely Carmichael is going to become more militant. They're going to take SNCC from what was John Lewis's SNCC into SNCC, which is Stokely Carmichael's SNCC, which is into black power, um, which is much more nationalistic, which is more militant. Um, and, um, yeah, police brutality is an issue in 19, well, it's been an issue for a very long time, but in 1965, uh, police, police brutality is going to cause the, the Watts riots in LA. Six days in the Watts riots, 34 people were killed, 2,000 people were injured, um, and in the Kerner report, they said segregation and poverty have created in the racial ghetto a destructive environment totally unknown to most white americans what white americans have never fully understood but what the what the negro could never forget is that white society is deeply implicated in the ghetto white institutions created it white institutions maintained it and white society condones it so the coroner report looked at the causes of the, the riots in 1965 and they're like it is white institutions that make it i think the sad part about it is you could write this today and it would be the same thing black power is also seen in um 1968 olympics as people are going to raise their fists in the black power um they are expelled from the u.s olympic team for doing this the black panther party is going to be on the rise in 1966 with bobby seal and huey newton and things really just sort of like fall apart in 1968 when Mar the reverend dr martin luther king jr is assassinated in a memphis hotel when he is assassinated essentially it's a holy week of uprisings where there's 43 deaths 200 cities go into riots and people just basically break down i mean I mean, even Johnson said in 1968 on the assassination of MLK, you know, if I were a kid in Harlem, I know I'd be thinking right now, I'd be thinking that the whites have declared open season on my people and they're going to pick us off one by one unless they get a gun and pick them off first. So even, you know, Johnson is like, people are, you know, just done, right? And so in 1968, this is really a tough year. Uh, we're going to look at even more ways that 1968 was a tough year. Um, but Johnson is going to use this to pass the Fair Housing Act of 1968. It is going to get rid of the redlining, um, but it is a kind of small thing compared to, you know, the assassination of MLK. So, you know, just to kind of, you know, go over this. There is a culture of conformity. You have a liberal consensus. You have a strong middle where people believe in you know, government spending, anti-communism, you have McCarthyism, you have consumer cultures, you have Levittown, you have TV shows, all of this stuff is happening in the 50s and 60s. You have the beginnings of a rebellion with like early civil rights, radical politics, teen rock and roll, and beatniks. Uh, but all in all, before 1968, things are right down the middle. What we also see is that you know, the movement for civil rights starts in a rather like integrationist moderate view. And after the 19, after 1966 and 1968, it's going to become much more radical. All right. So your homework is to, um, look at your person that you were assigned and kind of like do one of the roles, be able to verbally talk about it in class. All right, guys, take care.